which I'm very happy about. We have Dave and Sam. I'm going to start with Dave, that's okay. <laughs> but they're both Florida beekeepers. So. Is that age before beauty? I didn't say it on loud. This time she did. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> um, but they're both um, accustomed to being Florida beekeepers. So definitely us as, as local bees here, ask any questions you have. They've probably been through all of it already. And I mean, they're probably like this wisdom is just coming out of their head like crazy. So please go for all your questions. And um, if you want to see more info about them, we do have um, all of that on our website as well. You can read up on it. So just a few bullet points. Um, Dave is actually retired from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Service. You don't feel <laughs> He's been probably more busy since he retired. <laughs> He's still on the board there, but he was a chief APRist right. there, right? Yes. Um, so there's been many projects and awards in his lifetime <coughs> there and other places. He's been all about the bees. Um, most important, very nature loving. I know that. Very kind hearted too. And um, like I said, also still busy on boards and also the chair of education outreach for the Florida State Beekeeper Association. So if anybody is interested to ever go to a state meeting, you probably will see him up there as well. We just did and his beautiful wife was helping out a lot with volunteering there as well. And then just a fun fact, not only <laughs> does he know good German beer, but he also speaks German. And his lovely wife from Germany, Ursula, is here today. And if you'd like to, she has a stand set up in the back today. Please make sure to stop by. It's her art. Um, today she just brought jewelry. Just, there's lots of jewelry up there. But she also does nice copper work and all other cool, uh, cool stuff, which you can see on her website. And also does custom prints. So if you have anything you have specifically in mind, let her know she can make it happen. She can do magic, true artist. So I'm uh, moving on to Sam. Sam is a heavy duty queen rearer. If you haven't seen the little box up front here already, I'm not gonna shake it. I'm gonna be very <laughs> nice and gentle. But there is queens and they're for sale. And if you want one, you make sure you grab it fast and reserve one, otherwise they're gone. But there's tons more, I've been told. So he had a really good start this year. Um, anybody from Backyard Beekeeper or the big commercial beekeepers, he has queens available. They hatch every week, right? Um, they're $30, so very reasonable for a really great quality um, queen. And they usually start, I think, at 45 plus sometimes even, right? So this is a steal. All right. Um, he's a chemical-free beekeeper as well. So his bees are very resilient and locally adapted. Really, really important for all of us to know out here. Um, and he is known for his expansion beekeeping. Maybe we can touch on that today, yes? Um, and also his, now let's know, I, I, I know there's a word out there for it, I'm calling them Sam Comfort Bee Boxes, sure. which are like little mating nukes. <laughs> he specialized uh, with uh, little bamboo skewers, right? So fun stuff, if you never heard of his story before, maybe we get some questions or maybe he can touch on it or find him after and ask him about it. So that's really fun. Um, let's see what else I have over here. Of course, loves nature and anything wild. And, yes, thank you for the tunes. My reminder before I'm losing it. He is also very musical and he will make it entertaining. So please give it up for the two of them. I'm very excited to have them here. raffle real quick here all night long and one thing we're going to do is make sure that when you're asking your question we'll hand you the mic that way it goes on to the can you pick it up all right no problem then we don't need that you just speak we just up. need you to speak up and i'm going to stand up i hate to see the back of the audience's feet and not anything else uh i've been keeping bees for about 52 years now i guess given my age now so Started out as about four or five years old, fell in love with bees. Uh, wanted to know why they did what they did. You know, the insects uh, just got me interested in them. And my dad and mom were thinking I was nuts at the time. And so when I started helping our next door neighbor that had about 300 hives at the time, they really thought I was nuts because I'd go on Wednesday and help him work his bees and do things. But I learned to work bees in, like Sam dressed and shorts if I wore a shirt 
we didn't worry about it. Bees have changed a little in the last 50 years. Some of the bees down in this area, they're a little more defensive. They've got a little bit of survivability, some African genes in them. Uh, they're not pure line bees that we're used to. But uh, we raised queens uh, for about 28, 30 years of that 50 some years. Uh, so I'm very familiar on queens and being the chief of apiary, I started as not the chief, I started as a little guy that was uh, 30 years old and actually was paid part-time to be a part-time inspector doing 40 hours a week. I'm not sure how that's part-time, but in the bee business, that's a lot less as a commercial beekeeper, but I was still helping my dad and my son at the time work their uh, commercial operation. So I worked up from that into the research field, then back into the supervisor of inspection, and then took over as the chief inspector. Did that for 27 years and uh, decided a year and a couple months ago to retire. And since then, I'm working vice president of uh, Bees Beyond Borders. I'm on the board of directors for uh, conservation of honeybees or conservation of bees for the American Beekeeping Federation. I'm the CEO, as I call it. It's not the CEO, it's the chairman, like uh, Gabrielle said, of uh, Outreach and Education for the State Association. The State Association is sponsoring right now the State Fair. We have a huge exhibit inside of it uh, in the Ag Hall of Fame building uh, that I helped put together two days ago and then had to be down there yesterday all day. Uh, it was exciting, but uh, we got to talk for about 30 minutes to the Commissioner of Agriculture. Uh, Nikki Freeze came by spent more time than any commissioner out of 27, 28 years of me going down to the state fair. She spent about an hour and a half in and around our area talking to everybody. Uh, this is the first commissioner. I've never seen anyone stay right there. Normally they walk through the area and they're right back out and gone somewhere else. She took it on herself to stay there and talk to the people, especially the young kids. I noticed all the 4-H and FFA people, she really did a good job of promoting her a little bit on that. Uh, some of the other stuff we have going on, it's actually our 100th year for the state association. So we are putting on a huge exhibit, hopefully this year at UF in October, the last week of October, I think it's 23rd and 24th. Uh, we're gonna be having the state exhibit up there in state beekeeping. So that's also the other thing we got going on in March is the UF Bee College. So I'm one of the only ones that's made it to all of them. I think I've seen Eric there at most of them, but uh, I had the honor of going to all the Caribbean Bee Colleges and all the state bee colleges. And it looked like we were going to do another Caribbean Bee College in Puerto Rico, but it looks like because of the earthquakes that keep going off down there, we backed it up. It was going to happen in March. Now it's going to happen, we think, in June, July, or August, if the earthquakes stop. So I'll pass it on to Sam, give him, <laughs> let him talk a little bit. Then y'all can start uh, nailing us with questions. So. All righty. Uh, not the ukulele or guitar? Oh, not, not yet. If the talk really goes sour, we'll, we'll play some music. All right. Thanks, Dave. It's always good to no see problem. you. No problem. Yep. Well, um, I'm Sam Comfort. I run Anarchy Apiaries. <laughs> I've been a commercial beekeeper now for 17 years, but I, uh, I consider myself a recovering commercial beekeeper because uh, rather than building a bee empire, I'm, I've always been interested in experiments and games and theory. So uh, you go into my bee yard, it's uh, all kinds of stuff going on at once. But uh, I raise queens mostly these days. Last year I raised about 4,000 queen bees. And we can get into what that entails and what that looks like in a little bit. But I have a question for you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Do you remember about 10 years ago getting a call from our bee inspector at the time, Bud Grant, saying that there's this guy down here making hives out of cardboard and duct tape? Sure I do, sure. So uh, I have the privilege of having the first top bar hive that was inspected and registered in Florida. No one had ever seen anything like that before. And yeah, I was making them out of cardboard and duct tape and all kinds of stuff. But uh, so I'm going to start with a magic trick right now. I'm going to make a top bar hive appear out of thin air. Oh, it's basically thin air, but. So this is a pink one. I have baby blue ones as well. There you go. And you might want some sides on it. And then 
some sticks. That's why it's called the top bar hive. They lay on top just like so. So you can keep one on the, you know, behind the seat of your car and stuff. You see that swarm, anything like that, you got a box to shake bees into. So that's about all I got to share. <laughs> uh, come on now, you got your queen, yeah, queen yeah. mating. Okay, well, I, I got all kinds of things. I, I, um, like mentioned, I have brought some queens. These days, um, I've been experimenting with hive designs for years, mostly because I taught myself how, how to raise queens while working for an operation um, in Vermont. And 2005, I taught myself how to graft. Grafting is the process of taking a little tiny tool and picking up a larva. And we're going to start right with the complicated stuff. So I'm going to pass one of these little tiny grafting tools around. This operation I was working for in Vermont had crashed due to varroa mites from 1,000 hives down to about 200. And they called me. I was on the West Coast doing almond pollination for a big beekeeper with 5,000 hives. They called me, asked me to come back to the East Coast and do whatever I could to save the bees, save their bee business. And so me, not knowing any better, said, sure. <laughs> uh, and they stressed the fact that I was going to be all alone. Uh, the boss, he was tied up in the marketing end of things. He had shipped all the bees down to South Carolina to give them, hopefully, a milder winter, an earlier spring buildup to save his bees. And so he dropped me off there, spring of 2005, said, good luck. I had to call him and tell him like, how serious the situation was because the ground was literally crawling with shriveled wing bees. They had a disease called deformed wing virus. And he had a white strip in every single box. That white strip was called check mite. Check mite is kumafos. It's an organophosphate. It's a neurotoxin. It's really nasty stuff. Well, I pulled up one of these white strips out of the boxes, and there were varroa mites crawling up and down on the strip that was meant to kill them. The mites had developed resistance to the treatment. And these bees were going backwards. It was like a dire situation. I looked around. I was 24 years old. I was responsible for millions of little lives. And I really had no idea what I was doing. So what I did was hook up with a couple local beekeepers, did some reading, and I taught myself how to graft, how to raise queen bees really quickly to start the recuperation process. And these days, I use this handy-dandy Chinese push-button grafting tool. It costs all of $2.99 at any bee supply place. But that spring in 2005, I didn't have this handy-dandy tool. What I had was a paper clip. And I flattened down one end into a spoon, and I taught myself how to pick up these larvae, transfer them into a queen cup like this, and start raising lots and lots of queen bees. So rather than letting this a strong hive swarm, getting one new queen, or splitting it in half and walking away, what we call a walk-away split, and letting them raise a queen in an emergency situation, I can go into that strong hive and I can graft 40 or 50 of these queen cups and start 40 or 50 new queen bees. So I'll pass this around and you can see this little grafting tool. And, and so this is a, a, the real um, bulk of what I'm doing these days, like raising thousands of queens this year. And in that situation, uh, when I, that spring I learned to do it, we were able to get the operation back up to a thousand hives through the process of grafting. And I've been grafting ever since, uh, raising lots of queens from the best survivors. And the boss said that spring said I'd done such a good job when we hauled the bees back up to Vermont. He said, take ten hives, take ten of whatever you want, find yourself a bee yard, this is your bonus. Since you're making less than minimum wage anyway, <laughs> you find yourself a bee yard. And um, those became the base of the bees I'm still working with today. I've continued those genetics. And that spring in 2005 was the last time that they were ever treated for varroa mites. I started picking off the best survivors. And just uh, every generation, I saw improvements. And so that was 15 years ago when I went treatment free. You know, I like to say treatment free, but not stupid. But <laughs> Uh, down here, we are so blessed. We, you all don't realize how lucky we are to keep bees in South Florida. I think some years up north, I have uh, half of my operation up in New York. Some seasons up there, I've kept them alive just by sheer willpower alone. <laughs> down here, the bees are literally growing on trees. You know, other parts of the, of the world, you know, they sell bees, they sell honey. Down here, you get paid to get more bees and more honey out of buildings. It's, uh, it's really a, 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 a very fortunate environment that we have. Super good nutrition. Uh, our local bees tend to be on the nice side. You know, some are kind of runny, some are swarmy. Uh, occasionally, there's one that's a little feisty and stuff. But they all have a natural resilience because they've been dealing with mites now for decades here without any management, without any treating. 
and the commercial guys that are moving uh, in between states and stuff are breeding these super mites. So one of the, the things that I want to get across tonight is don't buy bees. They're easy to raise yourself. They're easy to get more. There's people in the club here who have more bees than they know what to do with. If you buy somebody else's bees, you buy somebody else's problems. And whereas we have a lot of good stuff going on. Of course, here I am selling bees, you know. But, yeah. but I would also like to put myself out of a job. That won't hurt my feelings at all because we could all be raising gentle, really great local adapted bees in our own backyard. So, and you all can be part of this. So that's about it of what I'm doing these days. And uh, we can open up the show floor. Your, show your you guys want to see what this is? Well, who wants to hold the queen bee? <laughs> okay, well, you can pass it if you don't want to start around. Okay, so we'll pass her on around. And she's a mated queen. I put her in that little cage yesterday. She's got five attendants that are keeping her warm. She's the bigger bee in there. And so if you can pass her all the way around the room. If she doesn't make it back up to the, the front, I'm going to check Joseph's pocket <laughs> right here. <laughs> are they from last year? They are from last year. Not, I, I just started grafting. You're, you don't graft until March. But the, that, this process of grafting is what us commercial guys do to make lots of queens really quickly. It's If you want to jump from you know 20 hives up to 100 or even 20 hives up to 200, you can do that really quickly here in Florida by that process of grafting. But other than that, you know, the bees do a good job making their own queens. Swarm cells or boxes cost money though. Yes, this is true. Unless, boxes cost money. unless I got about 80 cents invested in this little box right here. This is uh, the main box that I'm using these days. And this is some rough cut lumber I bring down. I get for like pennies a board foot. And so what I do, is uh, it's a rough cut one by six, and I just chop it up with a chop saw, and I staple in a really simple bar rest into this box that the bars can sit on. And I used to uh, like run those bars on a table saw until I discovered this. This is the forefront of beekeeping technology. It is a barbecue skewer from Publix. You know, get the jumbo skewers; they don't bow as much. You know. Uh, and the bees will actually make their combs off of these little barbecue skewers. So as soon as I found the barbecue skewer solution, I realized I was building the whole box without a table saw. I still have all my fingers. I'm very proud of that. Not all beekeepers I know have That's all their true. fingers. That's true. That. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but it's a really simple box that I can build, and I had about 1,800 of these last year on a three-week rotation. I know what I'm doing every single day of the year. You know, bees will take over your life. <laughs> this is what will happen. Especially if you're I think, raising queens. <laughs> yep, and yep. queens are very, very busy. So uh, I guess the last thing I'll pass around is one of these queen cells that has emerged. So you saw the grafting tool. This would be the final product. As, uh, you can see that there's a perfect in, uh, exit where the queen shooed her way out. And she emerges about a week later. After she emerges from that cell, she goes on a mating flight mates with 20 or 30 drones, and one flight comes back and starts laying eggs. I let them go another two weeks, so I'm on a three-week rotation. I'll take the queen, I'll put her in one of those cages. I, uh, every week I go to the post office with a big stack of buzzing envelopes. They think it's weird, I think it's weird. But I bring them a jar of honey. The, the queens tend to get there on time. I'll ship them across the country. And so I let them sit queenless for a day, and then I replace them with one of these raised queen cells. Uh, that was, she's going to uh, emerge from that queen cell in another day or two. So every three weeks, I'm into this little baby hive. And I'm also pulling out constantly little combs of brood out of here. So I don't even have time to, to go to my other bee yards. I'm locked into the mating yard, and queen season has just started. And I'm thinking about the 280 queen cells I have in the incubator right now. And I have 80 queens still like in the, the queen bank in the other yard. And it's just, uh, yeah, bees will take over your life. So. I guess we'll open it up to questions. <laughs> you know, uh, how are your bees doing? Good. <laughs> that good. Have a question, please uh, talk loudly, please. Okay, we'll, we'll start with Steve. I'll take one because uh, I just was fortunate to get my first swarm at 4 p.m. today, uh, and it was a cute little thing. And it's swarm season. You guys see it on uh, some of the Instagram posts and what's happening. So. Um, from you two, and given the new beekeepers that we have, what's this whole thing with swarming and how do you know what's going to happen? Well, let's explain what a swarm is to y'all that don't really know yet. A swarm of bees is, okay, 
Uh, Sam's saying I don't talk loud enough. Uh, a swarm of bees is actually a free hanging swarm with no comb in it. If you found a one with comb in it, we call it a cutout or a removal. You're actually trying to reestablish that established colony. A swarm's very easy to shake into either a top bar hive or an established box with frames in it. And I promote requeening it because you don't know how old that queen is. She's probably the older queen from last year or the year before. In this area, like Sam and I will both say, there's 13 months out of the year you can produce bees down here, or they're producing bees down here. Uh, there's always a nectar flow going on. It may be ornamental, as I'm calling it now. We used to call it wildflower, but in some of these areas, you got to call it ornamental honey. So uh, it's uh, wildflower is over in uh, Loxahatchee area, I guess. But uh, if you're outside of housing developments, which backyard beekeepers do a great job. So what I do with a swarm is I'd let it sit for a couple days and then requeen it. Uh, th let them get established even with that older queen in there. Uh, it's a lot easier to requeen an established hive and I'd let it have at least a little bit of brood started in it. So, or really? give it some. The swarm I've got, actually the option right. now is to pick up a sandy queen and yeah. put it in there. the middle girl anyway, yeah. you know, but then that's yeah. the thought of, okay, I can't just release her. I no, you got to let them release it. Yeah. So I was yeah. wondering, that, that's the thing where I had the opportunity to get a queen, but you're right, it's not the best thing to try to right. requeen a swarm. It's, right, it's hard to do. It's, uh, yep, so. Oh, yeah. So, uh, uh, talking about requeening, and that is the, the state's best management requirements on residential land. No <laughs> you don't have to say that anymore. But, uh, <laughs> but so the, the requirements are on residential land is to keep the public safe, right. you know. And there are some mean bees out there. They're like pockets, like Central Florida and stuff like that. And occasionally uh, along the coast here, we'll, we'll see something that's feisty that you don't want to put next to your neighbors, especially they like kids or like animals it. and so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how do you solve that? You change the queen. That changes all genetics. of the genetics in the hive. All those bees, all those worker bees are the daughters of that queen. So you change the queen, you will change their temperament, you will change their honey production, their uh, resistance to diseases and parasites, their ability to go through a dearth. All this is based on the genetics of the queen. So the queens that, uh, not too many of us, but uh, like a, a couple handfuls of us uh, uh, beekeepers in Florida who do raise queens, we get certified by the state. Our bee inspector, Chris Alonzo, he comes out to my apiary every year, and they used to take 100 worker bees and look at the wing veins, the wing morphometrics, to tell if they are scutellata genes, that's the Africanized bee. Uh, but these days they're doing cellular DNA. They actually take three little drone larvae and uh, pupae, and they'll actually test the DNA of my queen so I can have certified European bees, which hopefully will be gentle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next, if you're going to requeen the swarm, you take the old queen out, and how long should you leave them queenless before you put the new queen in? Ooh, Dave. <laughs> well, what they just showed by uh, pheromone release, it's actually the, once you've taken that queen out, within 15 minutes, that pheromone release from the queen is gone. So, in theory, you can do it within 15 minutes. Commercial operations normally do it within that hour time. They go through, make everything broodless, uh, or broodless, queenless, and then drop queens in that same right time. Away. Yeah. Uh, you can do it next day uh, if you like. If you don't have a queen and you accidentally kill a queen, you got to do it next day or three or four days. Mm -hmm. But you've got the possibility of them starting their own queen cells. I'll guarantee if you go three days, they've started their own queen cells. So, uh, it's what's convenient for you. Whether or not you open up that candy on the end of it. Uh, that's another thing you want to work on. Uh, if you take and requeen a hive right away, a lot of times it's better to leave that candy in there. And if you have attendance in with that queen, like Sam's are there, it's in the battery box, but he doesn't have bees around it. He's got them in with each individual queen. You would be better off to release those attendees into there and let them go away, but keep the queen caged up into there let that smell go through. I, I did stop recommending that people yeah. release the attendants because the queen will just fly away <laughs> She'll sometimes come right back. and things like that. 
you might get yeah. slightly better acceptance. Yeah. yeah. But I get like, those calls every year that the queen uh, flies away. I get the calls uh, that they uh, someone is doing an alcohol wash on their bees to um, check for mites. They for varroa mites. I think we've done them here in the the yard to yeah. the sample for varroa mites, and then. then Every year I get the call that someone put their queen in the alcohol wash. And oh, yeah. uh, every year I get the call that people will try to order queens and don't have bees. Oh, yeah. They, they think didn't... they can just put the queen in the hive yep. and uh, that, start it, that it works draws. for bumblebees. Yeah, it does. You know, it works for uh, wasps and yellow jackets and, and things. Bees and yeah, all solitary here. bees, the queen can go yeah. and forage and start a nest. Yeah. Honeybees are the only bee that are, are totally yeah. social. Yeah. They have to keep a cluster. So to start a new hive, you need a cluster of worker bees and a queen. So, uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll uh, go a little further on what Sam said. Uh, interesting part about queens. If your queen accidentally gets out of your cage and her wings aren't clipped and she falls down on the ground, if she flies away, don't panic. Don't run after her, chasing her and everything. <laughs> Guess what? She's going to come back right to where you were at or the vehicle you're sitting in. I was actually clipping wings for a project we were doing with the USDA one time. And I had the window open on the truck I was working in. I had about 250 queens I had to clip the wings on. And I'm sitting there letting some of the air go out and me staying cool in the truck. And next thing I know, one of the queens flies out as I opened up the cage to release the attendants to catch her, to clip her and mark her, and then put her back into the holding cage and then back into the cage. And one flew out, and I'm like, uh-oh. So I just waited, and about five, six minutes later, she flew back in the window. And second one did that that day. So it proved to me they will fly out and they'll come back. They're following their same scent trail back. So bees are very good. It doesn't work 100% of the time because I've seen a bee get a queen get away from me and a dragonfly catch it almost instantly. So sometimes you don't have control of Mother Nature. I was just going to say now that we're talking about queen and requeening, can we stress maybe? why it's important to do it a certain way and give an example. Oh, there's, hold on, there's 85 beekeepers in here. There's 350 ways of requeening. <laughs> no, I mean, but just the fact that, but you, you know, you cannot just stick a queen in there and that you might get killed, but why? Right. And, like, people who maybe never done this before. Yeah, requeening, what we're talking about, requeening, or putting a new queen into a hive, okay. or getting rid of the old queen in there. There's a lot of ways to try to find the queen in there. Uh, if you're inspecting the hive and you just want to know your queen's in there, easiest way is the way the bees react when you open that hive, one thing you'll notice. Uh, the next thing you'll notice when you pull out a frame that's hatched bees out of it in the last two to three days, you'll see little white eggs down in the bottom of the cell. Uh, that's a sign that your queen's been there in the last two to three days. So if you're just wanting to know that, put it back together, you're good to go. If you're wanting to requeen it, Search through there, find the first queen in there. I say to continue searching through that hive, find the second, third, and fourth queen now, I say sometimes, because I've had the action of finding four queens in a hive. Uh, either caging those and start a new nuke with them, or popping their heads off, if you don't mind doing that, and put a new queen into there. You can wait one to two hours, or you can do it immediately. If I got queens from Sam, I would probably uh, either introduce them with the candy in there, it, since they've got the attendance, or release the attendance and hope for the best there. <laughs> but uh, I, there's a couple other ways you can do it, but that's a simple way of uh, getting into I, I know Sam's are a lot easier because they're smaller hives to contend with until they got <laughs> 40 or 50,000 bees in them. So hold up. Yeah, that is a good point to make. If your hive is mean, so uh, I've been called to check out and requeen mean hives. I think 99% of the time they're like the nicest bees I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, a lot of it is how they're handled. Uh, I keep all my bees in full sun. That really calms them down. They're a lot calmer on the comb. They have a lot less issues with beetles and ants and moisture when you keep them in the full sun, even here in Florida. But if you do have a mean hive, and it does happen, I, I figure maybe I have one out of a hundred <laughs> that I see, um, bust them down into smaller hives. Say if you got one double deep, 20 frames of bees, bust them into like three or four smaller six hives. Because it, yeah, <laughs> or six yeah. or eight. Um, because you'll have a much better chance that they will accept a foreign queen 
and if it doesn't work, you can always recombine them later after the fact. So it, it's a, and also, if you're having a problem with bees or going to your neighbor's house or something like that, if you bust down the hive and make it s uh, uh, smaller hives, that will calm them down instantly. Because just changing the queen in there, it's going to be three weeks. Uh, it takes three weeks from an egg being laid to an emerging worker bee. So even if they accept the new queen with the, the gentler genetics, it's going to be three weeks before her offspring emerge, and then it's a couple of weeks that that they're actually at guard bee age. So it's a long time for the turnover in that population. A good so forty-five days. Yeah. yeah. My, my dad's favorite saying used to always be, "What you did today took forty-two days to have an effect on it," <laughs> and you know that's about right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. So there you go. And in the winter time, they, bees like to live longer, but they haven't figured that out here in Florida because they work themselves to death normally in about 40, 42 days. So. Back in the back there in the black sweater. Uh, yeah, you, <coughs> standing up. First getting started. Um, oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry. He's wearing black. <laughs> uh, he's wearing a black shirt. Oh, okay, well, let's do the order. Right right right. Order. Okay, <laughs> Look at the gavel. <laughs> Batteries didn't, now it's back. Oh yeah, we find actually fair, about we find about a third of the colonies because what you normally do is when you find the queen, you shut the hive up and go uh, off. You're you're good and happy. Uh, yeah, yeah, and all the books say one queen per colony. When we're doing research, and this started about how long has Jamie been here now? Twelve years, uh, probably about 12, 15 years ago. We were doing a lot of research and we had to actually evaluate the hives. We were starting to count three and four. Uh, well, normally it was two and three at that time. And now it seems like we're catching some with four queens in there, <laughs> two to three of them laying sometimes. You say, is that uh, mated yeah. Or yeah, they're mated situation. queens. We'll see a lot of times where you find an emerge queen out and it looks like they're starting to get into the process of swarming, which that would be normal for them to have the old queen the new queen, she gets mated, then they swarm off. And there's debate on how that occurs sometimes. But, you know, it's hard to read bees sometimes. They're good at spelling, but I'm not. But they can do what they want to do. So, uh, yeah, three to four queens wouldn't be unusual sometimes. They don't read the book either. Right? And they don't read the book. Go ahead. No. Uh, for new beekeepers, for those who, uh, like, for example, may have a neighbor who will, like, allow me to feed hives on their property. Oh, I like this one. Okay, you go ahead. <laughs> in regards to, you know, their peace of mind in terms of liability, is there anything that should be done or prepared or insurance? Well, actually, I, I know where you're going with this question because under the Florida statute, we actually changed the law of uh, 2012 so that anybody, as long as you're not in a HOA, homeowner association, because we cannot preempt their laws. Uh, in 2012, we changed it so anybody in the state of Florida could own bees and manage bees as long as they were registered following the Florida State uh, FDAX, best management practices that says that you will maintain, let's say I'll go with a quarter acre, uh, three hives on a quarter acre during swarm season, so all year round here in <laughs> South Florida, you can keep up to six for up to three months. At that time, you got to get rid of them, but you get three of them, half of them. So you could get three more the next day, you're right back. But you've got to manage those bees so that you're not causing a problem with your next door neighbor. Now, saying that a lot of times, we get next door neighbors. I, luckily, I'm not in this anymore, but I like the battle of this one. Uh, the next door neighbor may think you're a problem. Under the Florida statue, another one part of it, under agriculture, you cannot be a nuisance if you've been a registered entity in a farm agricultural part, being a beekeeper, for more than a year. So as long as you're registered and following our management practices for that first year, we've got to see that you're a problem. A problem would be having 10 or 12 hives on an eighth of an acre or something. Uh, 30, 40 know, hives. 30, 40 <laughs> hives. Yeah, we, we won't mention that. But causing a problem, you know. In an uh, inspector's eyes, one or two colonies on a high-density uh, high area is not a problem. Uh, I'll never forget doing an interview with a Miami uh, reporter, and I'm not going to tell whose property I was beside, but 
this person had about eight hives of bees behind there. They'd had a stinging incident, and this reporter was there early in the morning, and she was sitting there asking me these questions about bees and how far away you can get from them and stuff. And she failed to notice that as close to Sam and I, there was a, uh, I'd have called it a privet hedge, but it was actually, uh, I'm not sure what variety of plant it was, but it was blocking the view of the bees and it was about half as high as Sam. And uh, the bees were right there. And we'd been doing the interview for 15, 20 minutes and she'd never seen the bees, never been bothered by them until I said, the bees are right there. And she was like, we're this close to the hive of bees and it was morning time. And I'm like, yeah, as long as you're not pestering them, they're not going to bother you. We weren't in front of them. We were behind them. But uh, she was amazed. Afterwards, we went through some bees, thanks to Bud Grant down there, and uh, we went through them. But, yeah, you know, educating. But liability insurance, uh, as a registered Florida beekeeper, you're insured in a sense by following our best management that you're allowed to have bees on there. You can buy liability insurance if you want to. Uh, I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Depending on but, your liability insurance, um, depending on what you're doing, you can spend six, seven hundred dollars a yeah. year for for it, just to have a peace of mind. Um, they probably got uh, policies that are more catered for a homeowner, but you, you have to go through an ag uh, insurance in order to get it. But you you can find it. Um, I'm not quite sure as far as a backyard beekeeper. I mean, as far as myself, I think I pay eight or nine hundred dollars a year, but I, I I do it more for a living, not just a backyard uh, situation. So um, it, it kind of varies. And one I mean, thing you can actually go out, you can really go out, and you can get millions of dollars, uh, million millions of dollars of coverage, and you know, I mean, and you can spend. I know some guys they're, they're spending twenty five hundred to thirty five hundred dollars a year. And liability, and I said they're in, they're insane. It's a, it's a waste of money, but you know that's what they they do. And they're you know they're you know but they got employees, they got this, they got that. So you know it, it all depends on how much you want to spend. One other thing I was going to say, if you're not the owner of the property but you have permission, get written permission from the person that you're making sure that they're the owner or they have the management right of that piece of property. And the other thing is, don't go putting up 400 signs that say, beware of bees, beekeeper, <laughs> bee crossing, and out of sight, out of mind. Uh, we've had incidents where in, on the Keys, there was a person, he was a, a county commissioner. The next door neighbor of his was a former county commissioner, but they didn't really like each other. And uh, so the, lower county commissioner, the one that was ret retired, decided he was going to keep bees. He bought the equipment, bought the boxes, painted them, put them in his backyard, had them all getting ready, dried out, had not gotten the bees yet. The next door neighbor that was county commissioner from Monroe County, he decides to say, oh, we don't allow bees in Monroe County, you know, down in the Keys. Well, he called up to my place and I said, no, it's uh, our law, not your county code. We preempted all those in uh, 2012. And he's like, no, nope, I can make county codes that aren't that away. I said, go ahead, but we'll preempt them. They're preempted by statute. Codes can be uh, very easy. So he went on fighting because then he got to saying, well, these bees are swarming going into his uh, property. They're making little nests all around his house as eaves and stuff. So I sent Caitlin, who was our inspector at that time, down to look at them. She calls me laughing, talking to the other property owner because he had no bees in the boxes yet, but he was already being a problem. So, you know, uh, we had another incident here uh, where a lady put signs up for bees, bee crossing, beware of bees, and her horse owners that were next door went crazy. And same thing, she didn't even own bees yet. She just had flowers, wildflowers. And she thought those signs were nice to put up. And, uh, and I thought, okay, we don't do the wildflower part. So. I know you've got some stories on it. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah, not for the public. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what else we got? Okay, right up here in the front. As a backyard beekeeper, is it 
really feasible to raise your own queens sure. if you, well, now let me finish though. Sure. <laughs> the feral colonies that my are queens there, would right. mate with mm -hmm. are your, of your unknown. Drones. Your drones. <laughs> your drones. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's very possible. Uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's a lot easier than you think. If you've ever, if you ever had a hive swarm mm -hmm. and it requeens itself, you're a backyard queen yes. raiser. <laughs> it was mean, nasty, and got Then it's a problem. Yeah. Then uh, in those cases, you want a, a contingency plan that, like, worst case scenario, you, you move your bees away at night to some right. safe place that they okay. can be while you figure out what to do. Split them, requeen them, stuff like that. That's always a good go-to if it comes to that. So have a contingency plan. But other than that, I think it's a, actually a, a real proactive thing that we could all do is, is keep the gentle bees and do our own genetic selection. Each one of us in our backyards, you got a mean one, requeen it with a coma eggs from a, a, a nice hive. Uh, you don't have to learn how to graft or do all that like really kind of invasive, hard to learn stuff. Uh, bees in an emergency situation, when the queen is removed, they will make multiple queen cells. So you can go to your best hive, the one that's really nice, remove the queen or make a small split, they'll start lots of queen cells. And you can use each one of those queen cells to requeen other hives. And you're only controlling half of the equation, just the, the mother's side. I think, she I is think well, you're, really, there, but you're really controlling too, because you don't realize that as having your drone population from that mother line, what we used to do as queen raisers, we would give away queen cells the year before we give away that so that we had our mother line throughout the population of bees. Mm -hmm. You're doing that as a backyard beekeeper. If you buy from Sam and you're keeping his stock, your drones are going out and the, when they're mating with the queens in the feral population, they're out there. So you, mm -hmm. that DNA is there. So you've yeah. got the genetic. I think, the gene I think pool, that was I her main so. question was yeah. Yeah. with the drone population that's in around her yard, yeah. Yeah. she's wondering if it's worth her time try to mate to that drone population that may or may not be so right. friendly. If you're, the I mean, first yeah, year, I would true. say to use Sam's Queens to bring in, bring in, in that stock. Yes. And then after yeah. a year or so, get a good your start genetics point. are going to be yeah. filtering outward. And, okay. and, and because you're yeah, keeping healthier bees, mm -hmm. you're going to keep healthier bees. Those bees that are feral aren't quite as healthy, hopefully. And so your drones will be able to you know, be more virulent and everything. So I've yeah. seen bees in Arizona and West Texas right. that will take your face off, literally. Yeah, that's full suit, gloves, duct tape before you get out of the truck. We've they, actually they got a picture of him mean. with a full suit, all duct tape. Yeah, yeah. yeah the he last time. He doesn't wear anything. <laughs> They're really cool bees, yeah, but they can't work here. Them, so. So. Really. But I, I think there is, has been, over decades, there has been genetic selection because you can't have a mean hive in downtown Miami stinging pedestrians. Right. That hive is going to get found and eradicated. And it's been decades of this that is actually genetic selection. So like, uh, our, generally the population is pretty nice here. There are some rogue bees. There are some like mean ones here and there. But uh, uh, there are some pockets in Florida where they're a little bit uh, nastier, I, I think, like central maybe Tampa area. But in our area, we do pretty good with the, the drone some population. I on the island. They were pretty feisty. Then over, <laughs> over the past 10 years, when I go on the island now, it's not so bad. Yeah, it's amazing. It used to be. Yeah. It's amazing how much bees put up with us because, uh, and I think this genetic selection of, like, uh, it's amazing that bees, like, really permit us to go into the hive at all. Back in medieval times, people kept skeps, these straw baskets, and they would kill off their bees to harvest the honey. It's the only way they knew how to do it. They didn't have frames or bars or anything like that. And they would kill off half their bees, and they would leave half of them. For the next spring, they would catch swarms from that half and repopulate the ones that they killed. Well, if you're going to kill off one of your hives to harvest the honey, you're going to kill the mean one, the one that stung you <laughs> this summer. So you're talking thousands of years of this. I mean, it's like really one of the reasons our bees are so gentle, as brutal as it sounds. <laughs> but we could do this proactively in our backyards, keep the nice ones, propagate them, requeen the, the mean ones, and we're all a part of this solution, and it's already going on. Yeah, well, actually, if you look back to why we changed the statutes in 2000, started in 2006, was we were starting to find more African, more defensive bees. I don't like to call them aggressive because bees don't go searching out people. Wasp and yellow jackets do that, and some of the beekeepers, I think, do that sometimes. But uh, what our idea was, in uh, 2006, we had about 1,200 beekeepers in the state. Uh, we had very few backyard beekeepers. 
we were starting to see Tampa area. We were starting to see the uh, Florida City north up through all the way to Lauderdale. Uh, over in Fort Myers, we were seeing bad bees, defensive bees, grumpy bees, whatever you wanted to call them. Uh, so we started thinking about it a little bit and said, you know what? If we get backyard beekeepers, get them making sure they're using European stock, we've got a healthier, more de gentle bee out there working in everybody's backyard. We went from roughly about 1,200 beekeepers in the state of Florida, which about 900 of those were commercial, about 250 of them were sideliners, and we had about 50 backyard beekeepers. Now we got roughly 5,000 beekeepers in the state managing, and of those, about 4,700 of them probably are uh, backyarders. Actually, they're saying 3,700, but uh, of those 3,700, you're managing only about 15 to 20,000 colonies in the whole area. It's really amazing. About two or three percent. Two or three percent. <laughs> so 98 percent of the bees, the 600,000, 640,000 colonies, are managed by the commercial guys or sideliners. But y'all do a great job of doing what we wanted y'all to do, which is make a gentle bee. And that natural selection, y'all are diluting the defensive population, keeping a gentle population. Uh, there's some other states that are following our uh, way of doing things. So, and it's also helped the po pollination. It's helped a lot of agriculture. I mean, y'all wouldn't be sitting here. I remember when we had five bee clubs in the whole state, uh, and now we got, I think, 52. And, uh, so. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I have a question. I was trying to go treatment free, but I decided to treat. With right. So my question is, I know you're supposed to wait after you do the six week treatment. You wait two weeks after that. After right. And then yeah. you can put on your super. So my question is, since the bees are still bringing in nectar and everything still, and the honey that's already in there, what's to keep them from transferring that honey into? A Normally, they'll food? consume that honey that they brought in once it's in there. They'll use it to raise brood off of, so you don't have much of a worry of them transferring it. Uh, I normally don't worry too much at once that two week period mm -hmm. has gone by we don't find much residue after that mm -hmm. it's normally because Apivar and Apistan both go normally into the wax more than they go into the uh, the actual nectar or honey mm -hmm. now Apivar breaks down its metabolites break down fairly fast so it's hard to find so but yeah wait that two weeks definitely if you're not going to treat be treatment free there are treatments out there or methods out there in order to get rid of those mites uh, it take us two nights to talk about that <laughs> but there are methods out there or management <laughs> techniques that can reduce it how about mentioning a few of them uh, some of them would be screen bottom boards your equipment that you're using can natural those are mechanisms a uh, variety of queens. Sam's a survivor queen. Not Sam, but his queens are. He's doing pretty good at surviving too. But, uh, there's some other things you can do, like breaking the brood pop, brood cycle, and going into there and treating with something that's uh, non-chemical that's out there. Can't you just put the queen in a cage? Yeah, that's breaking. Weeks? That's breaking the brood cycle. Making a nuke or a split is breaking your brood cycle. And then you go into there with powdered sugar, something that doesn't hurt the bees, and you can treat them. You cannot treat with powdered sugar for 21 days at three days apart and get a control. You will knock down mites. You will collect them on the bottom of the bottom board or in the screen. You can, you know, do some damage. You won't get control totally with it if you have a high population. The, the lady here so in yes. red. Yes. Uh, so if you have kids, where should you? Oh, I was going to say, where do you keep your kids? <laughs> uh, if they're five or six years old and they're interested in bees, teach them first, educate them about the bees. The problem with kids is we love to throw rocks and we love to do things with bees and agitate them. Teach them about them first. Let them respect them. Uh, I grew up with bees, I mean, right beside, you know, where I lived. 
And uh, most of the kids in my little town, Umatilla, we had more beehives. This thing's dying. Yeah. <laughs> we had more beehives in Umatilla than we had, had kids, chickens, families, <laughs> anything. Where in the yard would you keep them? Uh, the I would corner? keep them in the back corner so they're back facing corner. away and have to go up over uh, a flight yeah. path. Near a pond, face them over the pond. Yeah, as long as your kids aren't swimming in it. And you're talking about children, right? Not like goats. And, uh, I'll tell you a story about goats, too. And uh, European, this goes back 25, almost 30 years ago. Uh, I registered a beekeeper out west of Umatella. He had, at the time, like seven or eight beehives, had a nice area right in front of his uh, double wide, and set up. He called me about two weeks later. He says, these are African bees. He knows it for a fact. He said, where you came into his, I think his 20-acre lot he had, where you came in, the bees were meeting you at the gate, stinging you. And so we went to go, went over to check the bees. And since it's, quote, our first African bees we thought we had in Central Florida, I go out there with the old inspector drive up and as we're getting out the door the bees start bumping us and stinging us and we're like holy cow these are some grumpy bees mm -hmm. we get up to where his double wide was and we noticed the bee yard is fenced off and i'm like wow that's new and i look out there and he has about 20 goats in the bee yard and i watch this one little billy goat jump from beehive to beehive and he had made not he had made nubian beehives <laughs> they were as grumpy as could be and uh they were very defensive and uh, grumpy too yeah they've been jumped on so those type of kids you want to yeah. keep out of them but yes yeah. getting kids involved in bees yeah. is the best yeah. thing we could do yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah go ahead um i got grumpy bees in my yard and i think it's because i have ants Yes, it will do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Needles will make them grumpy. Manage ants. Managing the ants. It matters which variety of ants they are. Are they bull ants or are they little tiny black ants? Little black ants, sugar ants most likely. Very small. That, uh, if they're a red long legged ant, they're the crazy ant or the uh, Argentinian white, ant, white, yeah, white footed. There's Florida has about seven hundred different varieties of ants, <laughs> but the the carpenter ants are a bad one because they will pinch your heads off of the bees and wings off of the bees at nighttime, make your hive very defensive in the morning when you're out there working them. The sugar ants go in there and just harass the bees, go inside and take some of the nectar and honey out. Uh, best way to control them, get your hives up off the ground, make sure you've got some sort of either, the best thing is he's got uh, aluminum foil. If you can put aluminum foil with grease on the legs if you're using uh, wooden post or anything you've got to get it tight enough it stays or cans of uh, oil cans of oil Lots, uh, lots of coffee grinds coffee, coffee grinds, grinds will will cinnamon the cinnamon works yeah. but the problem with all of those they wash away when you have a rain uh, the other thing is if you're familiar with the I think it's a saran tape that they use for when they're putting down flooring it's a real like uh, shiny tape oh, yeah. The ants and stuff can't crawl over that. So you wrap the legs with about three wraps of it. Uh, they hit that. But anything that you can deter them that away. If you're getting carpenter ants, or bull ants as we call them, uh, move all the leaf clutter away from your hives. Uh, the borax will control them. Same thing with borax. It doesn't control carpenter ants. It will deter them. It will control most of your other ants. Uh, if you want to use a spray, Guard Star, which is a pyrethrin, any of your pyrethrins work. Uh, there don't are get some. Get it on your bees. Yeah, don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can spray some of it on your bees, but uh, they don't like it. Do it as a granule. Granule. Well, some of the granules you got to be careful with. Bees will actually, if you throw them out as granules, they will sometimes look at that and say, "Hmm, looks like pollen. Carry it up." And so you got to be real careful with it. Uh, wet it in late in the evening time; it'll dry. And uh, ants, it causes a barrier there. So. All right, so real quick, I've got stands, four right. legs on them. I've got these eye bolts screwed into the bottom of them mm -hmm. so I can level, level the knife out. I could get a stainless steel sauce cup or something, put it underneath oh, yeah. that, and then put water or oil in there. Oil. Put oil. water with oil. Uh, the thing is, now you, if it gets rained, it will flood over. So you've got to build some way of either putting aluminum foil. And leaving it so the aluminum foil doesn't get touched, but some sort of a roof over it. 
or grease the legs. Anyway. Yeah. What, if, what if you're using cinder blocks? Cinder blocks? It's hard to, <laughs> hard to besides putting bolts to level them up, uh, and they're bad about getting the bull ants in between and under the cinder blocks. And next thing you know, they're taking out they your They got stuff called Niband. Niband works. Uh, uh, it kind of looks like sawdust. Mm -hmm. Niband works really well. It's a, under it's cinder a, blocks. I mean, yeah, you can sprinkle that around and the bees won't bother it. I actually, when I was going, last year when I went out to California, um, you could literally put it in between the beehives. And because the carpenter ants or bull ants get in between yeah. the six ways, and it's a nightmare. And I put the nye band in there, and it, it helped a lot. You know? so the nye band is also, it's not suggested for this, but the cane toads don't seem to like it as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah color gun works yeah. good for them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> These generally got, do a pretty good yeah. job keeping yeah. them out. Yeah, somebody yeah. all the way in the back yeah. there. Oh yeah, bees will groom each other. That's yep. a natural process. That's a good thing. You want them to groom. That's uh, important for them, and it, it controls the mite population. And that may be some of the genetic traits that we're looking at of grooming and controlling the mites. There's other traits we look at as receipt or removing the brood out to remove the mites in the cell. The trouble with that is if the bees removing the brood out, it normally removes the six outer. Uh, cells of it to get to the one in the center so they're removing seven <laughs> bees to get rid of one mite or two mites so. yeah but the grooming behavior is really good yeah. that um my friends the mixes in north florida yeah. actually uh, I've, I've started some genetic families i actually keep track of the family lines with numbers and keep notes so a lot of these queens come from the mix of red pin line and they've been shown to actually groom the mites off of right. each other by looking at a sticky bottom board not only will you see a lot of mites that have been knocked down, but the mites have been damaged. The bees have actually found them, ripped some of the mites' legs off, have damaged the mites' exoskeleton, and uh, people have bred this. Purdue University has been breeding the, the, the ankle biter bees, they call them, the mite biters. But we have them in Florida. All bees okay. do it to a certain extent, but it's something that we're breeding for, definitely. I actually saw a bee carry off a, a hive beetle. Mm -hmm. uh, you will that get that. that. That was actually a trait we found in the African bees. We don't find them, and we're talking, when I say African, there's 9 to 13 different sub-races of African bees. We're talking mainly Scutellatus, and that's why I kind of disagree, and I can say this, I guess, now that I'm not a state. When they're looking at the DNA of a honeybee, if you're looking at the differences in uh, nuclear or mitochondrial DNA, you can go so far down that you'll find that all of our bees originated from Africa. Yes. So when they're saying an African genetic, you know, it's bad. We need to find the actual uh, parts of DNA that make them grumpy and are defensive. But that would cost yeah, too much money to get to that yeah, DNA. It, it's so hard to keep it tracked. And the grooming part, we can actually find the DNA that is in there that causes that. But to keep it pure, you end up giving away too many traits to do it. That's why you end up with queen mates with 30 different drones. So, yeah. Okay, right here. How does the coffee ground work and how do you use it? It's the acidity of the coffee. It's the acid and the smells. Because as the ants, 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 ants uh, it communicate with the pheromone, just like the bees, they don't want to cross those pheromones <laughs> and the pH change. Yeah. They don't yeah. like it and they can't communicate. Uh -huh. So they stay away from it. If you keep making a barrier constantly around there, it'll basically keep the piles so away. So they walk in a path, yeah. right? Yeah. You see that? And they're okay. laying a pheromonal path there. Yeah. And if you can break that path, then they, they can't find it. Len, you had a question? Yes. Call the leaf up. A lot of bees, from what I determined, that colony collapse disorder. Are we still having those instances still in? Uh, we're we're st we're still having bee losses. Most of them are related to viruses and pests and other things that we can't really control yet. We're making healthier bees. We're still seeing beekeepers losing 50 to 75 percent of their bees. Most of them are commercial. But when you think about your backyard, or if you got three hives of bees and you lose two of them, you lost 30, no, that'd be 66% of your bees. So, you know, that throws our numbers way up. But uh, yes, we're still seeing bees collapse. I think, uh, I think it, mostly what we're seeing is not CCD, it's more no, like BCD, BCD, beekeeper yeah. collapse disorder. Yeah. 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 Yeah.